Hello everybody and welcome to the podcast. Today we're going to take a journey into the palace of the mind. We're going to venture into the deepest parts of your brain and in the process we're going to clean it up, brighten it up, sweep out the cobwebs and make it a much more effective place for learning and remembering English. So have a glass of water, take a deep breath and get ready for a brain upgrade because this episode of the podcast is all about memory, mnemonics and learning English. English has one of the largest vocabularies of any language in the world, which is quite an overwhelming prospect for those of you who are trying to learn all the words, or even just a portion of them, like the commonly used ones. But it's not just the words, it's the phrases, the idioms, the spelling, the rules of grammar. It's a challenge, but you can do it. The question is, how? Well, let's look into it. In this episode, we'll be looking at ways to improve your memory and some specific mnemonic devices for remembering English vocabulary and spelling. So strap in, this is going to be a useful one. With the methods in this episode, you'll be able to remember massive amounts of vocabulary and you'll be able to remember the spelling for loads of difficult to write English words. The techniques I talk about here are all well-known methods used by lots of people, including some of the most famous brains in the world. The illusionist Darren Brown is an example. He's famous for being able to remember vast sequences of information, and he uses this technique in his magic shows. Then there's the world-famous detective Sherlock Holmes. I know he's not a real person, but in the modern TV adaptation called Sherlock starring Benedict Cumberbatch, he uses a mnemonic device known as a mind palace in order to remember all kinds of information which allows him to solve deeply complex criminal cases. You can create your own mind palace too or just use memory techniques to help you remember names of people at a party, business contacts, telephone numbers, lists of phrasal verbs or the way English words are spelled and pronounced. We'll be looking at all of these things in this episode. These are all tried and tested techniques, and I invite you to try them for yourselves, even if you've never considered the idea of improving your memory. They're a lot of fun and surprisingly useful, and you don't need to try very hard to just play along. I don't want to go on about it too much, but if you just listen, it'll be quite entertaining, but you'll get the most benefit from actually trying these things yourself. And if you can do that, if you just try to apply the memory techniques in this episode, it could transform your English learning in a really exciting way. You might need a pen and paper so that you can join in with some of the activities. First, I'll talk about some advice for learning English more effectively based on mnemonic devices. I'll give you a summary of what I've learned from reading about this subject. Then I'll outline some specific systems for remembering lists of things, such as a shopping list, people's names, the order of adjectives in English, for example, or lists of vocabulary. Then we'll go through some specific mnemonics for remembering English spelling, which can help you to improve your spelling massively. So just to explain, a mnemonic is a method of remembering something. It's just a memorising technique. Mnemonic is an interesting word. It has slightly slightly weird spelling. It's spelled M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C. But the first M is silent. So it's actually pronounced mnemonic. Now, in fact, there is a mnemonic device for learning the spelling of the word mnemonics. And it goes like this. The, basically, the, the first letter of each uh, word in this sentence spells the the word mnemonics. So if you can remember this sentence in a meaningful way, then it can help you to remember how to spell the word. The sentence is, Mnemonics now erase man's oldest nemesis, insufficient cerebral storage. Okay? Mnemonics now erase man's oldest nemesis, insufficient cerebral storage. So the first letters of the, the words in that phrase all spell the word mnemonics. Say it again. Mnemonics now erase man's oldest nemesis, insufficient cerebral storage. Cerebral means of the brain, and storage 
which obviously means where things are stored or kept. Now, I've discovered while reading about this subject that the key aspect of mnemonics seems to be that you have to push the things that you're trying to remember deep into your mind and make links to things that you already remember well. So it's about linking things to existing memories, okay? The more personal the connection to that word, the more likely you are to remember it. But how do we do it? This means creating an image in your head and making it as vivid and clear as possible, attaching some kind of narrative or story to it, or connecting it to an already existing deep memory. I guess this is because in your brain there are electrical pathways. The brain is like an electrical system. Each electrical pathway is a connection to that word. Okay. Now the word really exists in in like physical sort of synapses in your brain, uh, brain cells. Okay. Your brain cells are the things, the physical things that actually hold information. So as I said, each electrical pathway is a connection to that word. So it's, it's a way for your brain to access that particular bit of information. So really, the more electrical pathways or connections that you have to something in your brain, the more likely you, you are to be able to access that thing later and remember it, okay? So how does this relate to learning English? Well, let's see if this confirms that you're already learning in the right way or if there are some new approaches that you can pick up. All right. First, you should really engage with the learning process. Don't let information just go in one ear and come out of the other. It has to go deeply into your brain in quite a personal way. So as a learner, you need to put yourself and your personality right into it and become an active member of your class if you're studying in a class with a sense of independent responsibility for your own learning. Remember that the stuff that you're studying, like vocab or grammar, is not just abstract information but something that involves you in a very personal and specific way. So you're right there in the heart of the, the, the language that you're learning, okay? So we're talking about personalizing new words. Think of examples or definitions of new vocabulary in a way that is meaningful specifically to you or to your life, okay? So when you're learning new words, put yourself into the examples of vocabulary that you use. Imagine that you're living these words and phrases somehow. Picture yourself acting it out, maybe. If I teach you a phrase like to doze off, meaning to go to sleep, just imagine a time when you were really, really tired and can hardly keep your eyes open, even though you really want to stay awake. Then imagine yourself reacting to that by saying, oh God, I keep dozing off. Okay, so put yourself in that emotional or physical space and then use the word. It's likely to create a much more reliable connection to that phrase. Imagine people that you know in your examples of new grammar or vocabulary and vividly picture something familiar to you when you're trying to remember the words. Bring the language to life in your own head. Create stories with the new language. Involve you, your friends or family in these stories and make them very vivid, colourful and dramatic. Like my pink gorilla story, for example. You could make your own pink gorilla story and aim to include lots of new language in it. You could perhaps think of very familiar places like your own home or the street in your town that you know very well. And you can then add examples of phrases or language being used in that environment it's much more likely to stick with you if you do it when you're trying to practice using new grammar or vocab don't just make a random sentence make a sentence which you really feel or you really mean obviously this is not always possible for example if you're doing an exam practice exercise in a book or if you just have to play with the grammatical structure of a phrase quickly in just to learn how to, to, to use it structurally. In that case, you might just have to sort of dash off a quick sentence with the phrase in it for structural purposes. But at some point, you should aim to use that phrase to express something meaningful and personal to you. This works for teachers as well. When explaining new words, try to give vivid examples. Bring the expression to life. The more vivid and colourful, the better. If you can, Try to attach some personal element to it. Put yourself in the example, perhaps. 
If you need to use the, th the third person, pick a real person, like a, like a celebrity or someone in the class, rather than just a name. I know it's, it's, it's not always possible to think up these vivid examples, or you can't always share personal details, but just remember, the more lively and vivid the example, the easier it is for the students to internalise. It also might encourage them to personalise personalize the language enthusiastically too, when it's their turn to use the language. I know, as I said, it's not always possible to do this. Sometimes when you're on the spot as a teacher or maybe as a student and you just have to come up with an example sentence, it's not always possible to use one that involves you in your own life. I mean, for example, I often just sort of pick random names. I sort of talk about John or Jeff or Jane or something. But it, I think it, it's become some, a lot more memorable when the example seems to be real, either because it involves you, the students, or a celebrity that everybody knows. New words can be quite abstract, so try making them familiar by attaching them to things that you already know. For example, the English word, maybe the English word that you're trying to learn looks a bit like a word in your language. Or perhaps it reminds you of somebody's name or something like that. You can then associate the English word with that name from your language and it sticks in your mind more effectively. For example, the Japanese word for apple is ringo. Ringo. Okay. I always remember this. I always remember the Japanese word for apple. I, in my pronunciation, it's ringo. But in Japanese, it would be like ringo. Okay. I always remember this. Because Ringo, of course, is one of the Beatles. He was the drummer in the Beatles. And the Beatles record label is called Apple. So now I think of an apple and I think of the Beatles and I think of Ringo. And so Ringo, that's how I remember that the Japanese word for an apple is, is Ringo. Right Now this method is common sense really, but we often don't, we often just don't apply these techniques to remembering things as much as we could. Instead, we often just try to cram information into our, into our head without doing it in a meaningful way, and as a result, we just fail to remember things. I mean, I'm thinking of examples. I often see students trying to remember word lists, and what they do is they just kind of go through the list and just sort of read each item in the list and hope that somehow the, the words are going to stick or they cover up the word and try and remember the next one. That can help, just remembering a sequence, but you'll find you'll definitely remember them more if you make those words relevant and meaningful to you in, a, in some way. We'll talk about remembering a sequence in a moment because there is a specific technique for doing that. So this also works with names, okay? At a party, for example, we all know what a nightmare it is to remember names of people you're meeting at a party or at a business conference or a dinner party or something. So when you are, when you're introduced to someone, as soon as you get their name, you must make a point of connecting that name to something you know well. For example, if the person's name is John, just imagine him with John Lennon, okay? Imagine this new John standing with John Lennon. Or maybe just imagine this guy wearing John Lennon glasses. You know those round glasses that John Lennon used to wear? Just imagine this new John wearing a pair of John Lennon glasses, maybe with long hair. You could imagine him walking across Abbey Road, like on the front cover of the Abbey Road uh, LP. John, like John Lennon. Perhaps you have another friend called John. So you can imagine the new John and the other John together, maybe having a fight. It could be like Street Fighter 2. You know, John versus John. Round one, fight. Hello, John. Hello, John. Hello. How are you, John? Perfect, perfect, perfect. John wins. Now, you won't forget it, will you? If, if you do those things, you definitely wouldn't forget it. Now, um, you do have to do that in your head. I realise that in the dinner party, you might be focusing on just trying to communicate and, you know, be polite and so on. But just very quickly, you can just create a, an image in your mind maybe of this John playing guitar with John Lennon or something and that hopefully will help you help the name to stick I do these things with my students they don't realize but I'm actually in my head creating connections between their names and things that I, I'm already familiar with and it works I remember their names and it helps me a lot so you could do that with everybody at the party 
or everyone at the business conference, and you will remember their names, and you'll have fun doing it. Just remember not to tell them, okay? For example, if you get drunk a little bit later at the party, don't go up to John and say to him, hey, John, how's John Lennon? How, how are all the other Beatles? Where, hey, when's the new album coming out? John, John, I love you, John. Don't, don't do that. That would be embarrassing. Sometimes, though, this memory technique does work against me. I have a student at the moment called Charles, OK? And to me, he looks just like Roger Federer, the tennis player. He looks exactly like Roger Federer for me. Sometimes I call him Roger by mistake, and he has no idea why I keep calling him Roger. I haven't explained that I think he looks like Roger Federer, and, and that's because he doesn't really look enough like Roger Federer for everyone else to agree with me. They would probably just think I was weird, and I'm supposed to be a professor, you know. Anyway, there's, there's just something Federer-ish about this student. So I do mistakenly call him Roger sometimes, even though his name is Charles. So what I need to do is imagine Federer meeting Prince Charles and perhaps being knighted by Prince Charles. You know, I pronounce you Sir Roger Federer of Switzerland. You know, I could imagine him being knighted by Prince Charles for being such a great tennis player. And there we have Roger Federer and Prince Charles. That should help. So next time I should make the connection between Federer and Prince Charles. Now, you might think that remembering all these connections is actually more complex than remembering the individual words or names themselves. You might think, well, if I just have to remember one name, why do I also have to remember an entire story? Surely it's more simple just to get that one name into my head. But that's not really true, because we're just making connections to things that already exist in your head. Okay? So all the, the other details, like the story, Prince Charles, they actually or, they're already there, and you remember, you remember them all. So you're not having to introduce new things, you're just attaching a single new word to things that are already deeply in your, in your mind. The more connections that there are, the more likely you are to remember the words. Words that exist with no connections at all are just lost in space, in your brain, disconnected and missing. You see, words like to hang out with other words. They're all connected in some way. So it's worth remembering that. And people often draw mind maps. You know, when they're remembering vocab, they actually draw a mind map which is a way of creating a visual representation of the connections between words. And this is actually a very good vocabulary learning strategy. Rather than writing your words in a list, you can write a mind map where you draw circles and lines uh, which indicate the connections between words and, and, and so on. It, it can help people to learn new words when they find out the origin of those words as well. They're often words have a backstory. So, in all these mnemonic devices, the words that come up a lot seem to be these ones. Vivid, personal, funny, and weird. Okay? So, vivid, personal, funny, and, and weird. Vivid means that it's very, very bright. Okay? Basically, very bright, very clear, very colourful. Personal, you know what that means. Funny, you know what that means too. Weird, of course, just means strange, bizarre, odd. Okay? So these are the key aspects of uh, an image that you create in your mind or a, a, a mnemonic device. So when you're linking a word to an image, you have to make it vivid, personal, funny, and weird. And that's how you really lodge the word deep in your brain. You could probably create a mnemonic to remember that. Vivid, meaning bright and clear. Personal, meaning related to yourself or something that you know personally. Funny, just something that makes you laugh. And weird, something bizarre, out of the ordinary and strange. Now, I'm just imagining the Simpsons, like Homer Simpson, just glowing, because they're vivid. You know, they're bright yellow, and they have these big bulging eyes. It's a very vivid image. They're funny, obviously. I mean, at its best, The Simpsons is one of the funniest shows on TV in English. I'm not convinced it's as funny in other languages, but in English, it is generally hilarious sometimes. So it's definitely funny. They're personal because it's about a family and we know them very well. 
We've grown up watching The Simpsons on TV. Homer, Marge, Bart, Lisa and Maggie. We know them very well, so it's quite personal. And they're weird because they're yellow and that's strange. They only have four fingers. And the sense of humour in the show is quite bizarre. Also, they've been on TV for 20 years and yet they've always stayed the same age. Bart has never grown up. That's pretty weird. So vivid, funny, personal and weird. You could maybe use The Simpsons in your images if you like. Those, those four things, though, are the key qualities for mnemonic images. So I've just given you some quick memory techniques for learning English as they occurred to me. But let's have a closer look at some specific tried and tested memory techniques and mnemonic devices. So let's have a look at some specific memory systems. These might seem like pretty weird techniques, but as I said earlier, if you just listen to this, you won't get the full benefit. You'll just enjoy listening to it as entertainment. So I invite you to try them for yourself because only then will you realize just how effective these things are. It can make a huge difference to your life, actually. Let's listen to a short presentation from the University of Western Sydney. This video is available on YouTube and also you can find a link to it on my website, of course. This video is about five minutes long and it clearly explains some mnemonic systems. The guy in the video speaks with an Australian accent. It's not a very strong accent, but you might be able to notice the way he says uh, some words like the numbers one to nine, for example. I say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In Australian accent, it might be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine. I'd say nine. He might say nine. See if you can identify a, a difference. Okay, so let's listen to the presentation from the University of Western Sydney about some mnemonic systems. Students often struggle trying to remember certain types of information. Mnemonics are memory strategies that make remembering information a bit easier, transforming tedious texts into vibrant memory. They increase your ability to remember difficult or unfamiliar information. They are most useful for learning information where there is a sequence you need to learn in a particular order, such as lists, names or numbers. Let's look at some common mnemonics. Acronyms. Acronyms are when a word or a term is created from the first letter of each item to be remembered. A well-known acronym is Roy G. Biv, which has helped many students remember the colours of the visible spectrum. That's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. Acrostics. Acrostics are another popular mnemonic. That's a complete sentence or series of words in which the first letter of each word stands for something to be remembered. My very educated mother just served us nachos. Helps to remember the planets in the solar system in order from the sun. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And passing exams may be difficult at school. Helps to recall an order of operations in algebra. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. The PEG system. The PEG system is useful for remembering numbers. It uses key words which are represented by numbers. For example, one equals bun, two, shoe, three, tree, four, door, five, drive, six, sticks, seven, heaven, eight, gate, nine, wine, ten, hen. To remember the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. Imagine an iced bun, one, Walking through a gate, eight, made of sticks, six, one eight six. Image mnemonics. When the information to be recalled is constructed in the form of a picture that enhances memory. The crazier the image, the more likely you are to recall the relevant information. You don't need to be an artist as long as you know what your drawing means. You can use an image mnemonic to remember BAT. The depressant drugs, barbiturates, alcohol and tranquilizers. You could draw in your notes a depressed BAT that took barbiturates, alcohol and tranquilizers. 
If you needed to remember the name Julie Gilmore, visualise a fish with large gills wearing jewels. Chunking. Chunking is another method. It involves grouping individual pieces of information together in a way that makes them easier to remember. For example, the individual digits 1, 8, 4 and 6 are easier to recall as the year 1846. Or a shopping list might be more easily remembered when items are grouped together by food categories, such as drinks or vegetables. Mind maps. Mind maps are a visual pattern that can create a framework for improved recall. They consist of a central word or concept. Around this central word or concept, you draw the four to ten main ideas that relate to that word. You then take each of these words and again draw out the main concepts that relate to that word. Be creative and use different colours, symbols, pictures or acronyms to help organise ideas. A major benefit of mind maps is that they vividly and accurately show relationships between ideas. They also help you to understand a concept from the broad and general to the very specific. The keys to making mnemonics more memorable are... Use positive or humorous images. Funny and weird images are easier to remember. Exaggerate particular parts of the image to help it stand out. Vibrant, colourful images are easier to remember than dull, drab ones. The key thing is that mnemonics should clearly be associated to the concept being remembered. It must be vivid enough to be easily recalled when you think about it. These are just a few examples you can use to enhance your memory. But there are hundreds of examples on the internet, or you might have some fun just creating your own. Okay, so a number of different techniques mentioned there. Let me just summarize, just to make it clear. So he talked about acronyms. That's a word. Each letter represents something. For example, Roy Gabiv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Roy Gabiv. I used to use Roy Gabiv as a, a memory technique when I was a kid at school. I didn't really realize. I was kind of employing a method, but uh, it helped. Roy Gabiv. I just imagined a guy called Roy who was very colourful. He wore lots of bright, colourful clothing. Roy Gabiv. And the surname Gabiv is quite a fun one to say. It's quite unusual, and it's got that fun kind of plosive sound in the middle, which is quite uncommon. Gabiv. Roy Gabiv. Acrostics. That's a sentence in which the first letter of each word spells out the thing that you need to remember. The peg system, that's where, for example, words represent numbers. And then you can create an image using those words. It helps you to remember a, a number. Numbers on their own are quite abstract. Unless you can attach those numbers to other things. Image mnemonics, I've talked about this with the John Lennon example from earlier on. Chunking grouping individual bits of information together to make them easier to remember. This helps with vocabulary because words are often grouped together. So you shouldn't just remember a word, but remember a whole chunk or group of words. For example, whether that word is followed by a particular preposition or verb form, for example. Mind maps, we've already talked about this, but you can make your own mind maps and you can make them as personal as you like. Create any kind of connection between words that will help you to remember them. At my university course, I have to remember some details of the assessment procedure for my course. Students often ask me. For some reason, they can't remember it themselves, so they're always asking me. They should remember, and I definitely have to remember. Basically, the grading system was continual assessment which included lots of different criteria. And it was all the different criteria that were fairly hard to remember, especially when I had to just come up with them off the top of my head. So the different criteria would be things like their development through the course, their English in a presentation, their attendance, absences, and just the way in which they took part in class. So to be honest, it was quite hard to remember those five items and to say them all very quickly but I managed to group it together I, I came up with a system I called it the five P's the five P's and I came up with words that represented those things and they all began with a P so the five P's progress presentation presence punctuality and participation and that helped me to remember it and it also helped the students to remember too so whenever anyone asked me about the assessment I could say 
it's the five P's. Remember the five P's? Progress, presentation, presence, punctuality, and participation. Now, knowing that there were five things and that they all began with a P allowed me to quickly recall and summarize the assessment type in the middle of a lesson. Now, let's go on to look at the linking system. I did mention this briefly earlier on. The linking system. This can help you to remember lists of apparently unrelated items. It could be a list of nouns. It could be a, a shopping list. I've taken this explanation from a book, actually, and it's a really great book called Tricks of the Mind by Darren Brown, who I mentioned earlier, and who, in my opinion, is one of the world's best illusionists and a bit of an expert on mind control techniques, hypnotism and mentalism, right? He's very interesting because he, he deals with the subject in a very common sense and scientific way without all of the mysticism which often accompanies this subject. So if you're interested in the subject, I suggest that you get a copy of Tricks of the Mind by Darren Brown. It's, it's a great book full of really practical, sort of scientifically based approaches for sort of mentalism, mind control, hypnotism, and other stuff like memory techniques. So let's have a look at the Darren Brown memory list then. Okay, we're gonna do an experiment here and it, this is from Darren Brown's book. Okay, so let's, tr let's try this memory improvement experiment. Later on, you will need a pen and paper, but you basically, you have one minute to remember uh, these 20 things. Okay, I'm just gonna list the 20 things. Let's see how many of them you can remember. The first one is telephone, telephone. Second, sausages, sausages. Third, a monkey. A monkey. Fourth, a button. Fifth, a book. Sixth, cabbage. Seven, glass. Eight, mouse. Nine, your stomach. Ten, cardboard. Eleven, ferry. Twelve is Christmas. Thirteen is athlete. Fourteen is key. 15 is wigwam, 16, baby, 17, kiwi, 18, bed, and 19, paintbrush, and finally 20, walnut. Okay, now let's see how many of those things you can remember. If you have a pen and some paper, you can now try and write down as many of those things. Don't go back just try and write them down in order okay so we're just gonna you can pause here um, while you try and write them down all right so I'm assuming that you've paused and let's continue all right so how many did you remember I wonder how many things did you manage to write down so if you've got between one and five things then you probably need to learn how to do this technique if you got between five and eighteen items that's pretty good but you can definitely improve and if you got between 80 and 20 items then it means that you probably already know this technique now let's go into it in a little bit more detail shall we okay so here's the technique in a nutshell we're going to take a word and find a visual link with the word next to it so not just any picture that happens to link them but one that involves the following criteria okay has to involve these things in your in your picture all right and the criteria is first the picture should be vivid that means that you need to take a moment to clearly see the picture in your head once you've decided upon it also let yourself emotionally engage with it for a moment if the picture is amusing look at it and find it funny okay all right so vivid clearly clear emotional funny all right now if if it's disgusting if you've chosen a disgusting image, you should actually find it repulsive. Ugh. Some people don't think they can visualize anything. But if you think you're one of these people, don't worry. There's no proper visualization process involved. It's just easy. You just, just picture it in your head. Right? Imagine you're looking at a photograph of, of it. Okay, the second item, second criteria is the elements of each picture should interact. So picturing A and B just standing next to each other won't really work. If A could, could be doing something to B, 
You know, if they could be dancing or doing something together, that's much better. They need to interact with each other, all right? So you've made a picture of, it, of the item, and then you make that picture very vivid, and then you picture the, the next item on the list, and they're interacting in some way, doing something funny, meaningful, emotional, something like that. And you really feel the, the, you really feel something when you see this image. So it could be something violent or something ridiculous. For example, the, the picture should be unusual. If you have to link the word man with the word cup, for example, you may be able to vividly imagine those two things interacting, but the picture might just be too normal, such as a man drinking from a cup, a bit boring and normal. The picture will be more memorable if perhaps the man and the cup are interacting in a really extraordinary way. Okay, so maybe the, the man is trying to drink from a giant cup into his face, or there's a tiny little man trying to get out of a massive cup before some hot tea gets poured on top of him. Okay, that's a much more vivid image and therefore will, will make your, your brain remember it. Okay, so bear those points in mind while reading these things, okay? So here are just some ideas of ways of connecting the items in the list. First, we had telephone and sausage. So you could imagine trying to dial an old-fashioned telephone using a flaccid, uncooked sausage. It feels revolting and it's cold to the fingers. It's utterly impractical to work the old dial of the telephone with this flaccid, limp sausage. I can maybe get the dial around a little bit, but then it breaks, you know, the, and the sausage starts to fall apart. It's disgusting. It's frustrating trying to dial a telephone with a sausage. That's not what sausages were invented for, okay? The next thing is sausage and monkey. You could imagine watching footage from a wildlife documentary of a monkey in the jungle, and it's cooking sausages on a barbecue, just making a fry-up, having an English breakfast. These are very rare monkeys, and this is the first time that they've ever been filmed. Maybe you could think of a name for them. They could be the, the English breakfast monkey, okay? And next to him, he's got some ketchup and some brown sauce as well. Just a monkey in the jungle cooking up a sausage. Lovely monkey breakfast. Next thing you have to remember is monkey and button. Now, you no longer have to spend valuable time doing up your own shirt buttons. No, that's not necessary because you now have a trained monkey to do such things. You stand there in your socks and the monkey does up all the buttons with his clever little monkey fingers. So you've got like a monkey servant. You can call him the button monkey and it's his job to, to do up your buttons on your shirts in the morning. There you go. So that's monkey and button. Imagine the monkey doing up the buttons with his clever little monkey fingers. <laughs> All right. Next thing is the, but, the word button and the word book. OK, so this is a book and it's all about buttons. It's a special button book. And in order to open it, you have to unfasten a line of very big, colourful buttons down the side of the book. It's extremely impractical and it makes opening the book really difficult. You, you, you love buttons and you want to read about this buttons in this button book. But in order to open the book, you've got to undo all of these buttons. And you're going to need your button monkey to do that, but he's too busy cooking a sausage, a sausage which certainly should not be used to dial a telephone. All right? Okay, so, so there you go. We've got the button and the book, the but buttons all down the book. Next was book and cabbage. So a cabbage is a kind of green vegetable, okay? So imagine opening, opening a book to have a quiet read at lunchtime. Just going to have a bit of a read. You're going to flick through your book. And you, you discover that the cover and all the pages have leaves of horrible, rotten, stinking cabbage stuck to them. So the pages have got all the cabbage stuck to the pages. It absolutely stinks and the book is ruined. You can't read it. You can't enjoy it. You're frustrated because someone has stuck loads of cabbage between the pages of your book. OK, next thing was cabbage and glass. OK, imagine a beautiful but enormous cabbage. It's, it's, and it's been realistically created out of glass. It's in an art exhibition or something. And the artist is there proudly showing off his, his glass cabbage. You know, he's flicking it with his fingers, ting, making a pinging sound. He's showing off about how great his cabbage glass sculpture is. Ping. And everyone is standing around with glasses 
right? They're all drinking glasses of wine and they're all going ping on their glasses of wine. And there it is, this huge glass cabbage. But you think it's ugly. You don't understand why everyone else thinks it's brilliant because what's so great about a glass cabbage? Nothing, except that it goes ping when you flick the edge of it. Next is uh, the word glass and the word mouse. Okay, so you got to drink a glass of wine. So you've drunk a glass of wine. In fact, you go to get a glass of wine, but you find that all the wine is gone. And instead, instead, there is a, at the bottom of the bottle of wine, there's a mouse. And the mouse is completely drunk. And he's having a great time. He's having a little mouse party at the bottom of the, the, the bottle. Okay? You know, he's just partying at the bottom of the wine bottle because he drank all of the wine okay he's covered in wine and actually he looks like he's having a really good time so that's the the wine that's the glass and the the mouse all right next is mouse and stomach okay all right so unfortunately we have to imagine something disgusting imagine that you've eaten a mouse and the mouse is inside you it's actually running around inside you, squeaking. You know the way mice my, my squeak? Well, your, stu your stomach is making all sorts of noises because you've got a mouse squeaking inside you. I know that's quite a horrible image, but imagine that. Imagine that you've got a tummy full of squeaking mice, which then, when you least expect it, come pouring out. They come pouring out of your throat because it's so disgusting. Mice everywhere because you ate one mouse and they multiplied inside you and you've puked up loads of mice everywhere it's a disgusting image it really is but mouse and stomach there you go all right next two items you have to link the word stomach to something else let's see what the next word stomach was next word was cardboard so imagine a pregnant lady who's covered her stomach with cardboard from old boxes so she's a pregnant lady she's got all this cardboard and she's taping it around her okay she's She's attached lots of cardboard all around her so that she now feels safe. She's all protected because she's covered up her, her belly with cardboard. You know cardboard? It's that brown card. They use it to make boxes. You know when you, out of the, behind the supermarket, they throw away all the cardboard boxes? Well, there you go. That's what cardboard is. So some pregnant woman has collected all this cardboard and she's wrapped it around herself and she's taped cardboard around her stomach and now she feels all safe because she's got cardboard all around her stomach. All right, next, uh, next words were cardboard and ferry. A ferry is a boat, okay? Basically, a boat that's, it's like a, a boat that usually that takes you across a stretch of the ocean, like a couple of hours. It's just a, a boat for transporting people. Cardboard and ferry. Imagine an image of a huge ferry sinking in the sea because in a spectacularly misjudged move to save money, they 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 made the the ferry out of cardboard. Okay, so it was a huge mistake. They thought we need to save money on ferries. We're going to make our ferries out of cardboard, and no one thought that it was a bad idea. And so this ferry, it's like the Titanic, is just sinking because the whole thing's made of cardboard. As people are trying to escape. In, in boats, dinghies, but they're unaware that they're just made from paper. Okay, the whole boat is made of cardboard, and we all know that cardboard absorbs water, so it doesn't doesn't really work, does it? Now, I could keep going with this. I could keep going with this, but I, I, I hope you can remember this sequence and just see it as a, as a way of effectively remembering. Now, if I kept going, and if you had done this originally, I'd, I expect that you would have remembered it a significantly higher number of words than you than you did the first time around by linking them all up ideally you'd actually make them all into a story and that's that's an even better way of remembering words going back to my phrasal verbs what you could perhaps try and do is create a story like every month okay so every 30 days or every 31 days have a look at the phrasal verbs that I've done for that month and put them in a list and then just try and try and create some kind of story which links which has a link between all of the phrasal verbs in it or at least a story which features all those phrasal verbs as regular things in the story i might do that 
I think that might be an interesting way to, for me to help you remember all those phrasal verbs. Maybe if I get the chance, I'll try regularly to upload an episode in which I try and improvise a story in which I use all of the phrasal verbs. Actually, I think that's a very good idea. And uh, I might be doing that if I get the time. The phrasal verb, the phrasal verb chronicles, I could call it. Interesting. Okay, now let's move on to another technique. And this is the idea of the mind palace. Now, this is what Sherlock Holmes uses in the TV show. It's an amazing idea. Apparently, you can remember massive amounts of information if you create your own memory palace. This is a massive space in your own head where you keep memories. It works by making connections to a place that you know really well. It could be your house, for example, or the route that you take to work, if you know it very well, or a part of a city that you know well, or your school building or something. So you imagine that you are walking around this place and in key spots, in key places, you plant a very vivid image of each thing that you're trying to remember. So if you're walking around your house, you might enter the front door and there is a hook where you normally put your coat and instead you hook something else onto it. It could be, you know, the thing that you're trying to remember. And then you, you go past this chest of drawers and on top of that you place another item that you're trying to remember. So all these key places you put an image of the thing that you're trying to remember in each place. And then you, all you need to do is then walk through this room or through this building. And in each key, key place, you've, you've established each item to remember. So it's locking in your memory of, the, of this location with the things that you, you want to try and, and remember. Okay. Now, all, all you need to do is imagine walking around the place and you'll remember everything. And also, when you're doing it, you can say, hold on, let me go into my mind palace, which sounds pretty cool, especially if you're a Sherlock Holmes fan. Let's hear Darren Brown talking about how he uses his mind palace. OK, let's just have a little listen to Darren talking about his mind palace. I realise this episode's going to go on for a little bit, but that's all right, because you can just pause it, come back to it, listen to it in stages. OK, let's see. The mind palace of Darren Brown. One of the things that fascinates me is this idea of a memory palace. I, I love it. And the idea is that you, if you want to remember a lot of information, it can be anything from a, from a, you know, a shopping list to a speech to uh, a whole discipline of information or your address book, you know, it can be anything, is you, you turn those pieces of information into things that you can visualise, into pictures, preferably things that are sort of bizarre and, and very memorable, and then you you put them in an environment that you know very well. So if you used your home, as long as you're not changing your furniture around too much, you could use your home and you could go on a mental walk through your home and then in each room you'd put, so if you're going to, first of all, you're going to go into the hallway and there's a hall stand, you can put, you know, I've got to remember to take the suit to the dry cleaners, so you'd put an image of a bright, gleaming white suit on the hall stand and then the next thing I've got to do is buy some stamps and so you know the next route would take you into the front room and maybe you'd end up in a room like this and you'd look around and you'd seem to be full of... Chaise Long for some reason, this is not where I live. The tasteful leopard print Chaise Long there might be the first thing you'd come across, so you'd put the next thing you have to remember on that, maybe reclined on it. Again, you'd find some funny or bizarre way of imagining it. The next thing maybe on this one, maybe you'd work clockwise around the room, things in the corners, next to things that you know won't move. And you, as long as the route is something that you'll, you don't have to think twice about, and as long as the images you make are in themselves memorable and funny or whatever and so on, then all you do is you just mentally wander around that thing and you know you immediately see the big white gleaming suit on the hall stand and then you walk into the room and you've got the thing next thing you know you don't have to think about those things anymore and I use it all the time I have a route up my street that you know if I'm falling asleep at night and the things I need to remember to do the next day but can't be bothered to write them down because I'm falling asleep I start to plot them against shops that I know going up my road I have a mental map of central London that I'm plotting the, the history of art into because I just thought that would be a lovely thing to have a real grasp of, and it could be wines or any, anything that you've... And things with a lot of information that are just difficult to sort of sit down and learn. So in a way it's a device for stopping people losing a sense of themselves, losing a sense of what's important to them? I think so, yes. Memory palaces were used for, for spiritual development, you know, they weren't just used for memory. You would store experiences and you would store wisdom, really, in these environments that then you could wander around and, and draw from, I suppose, at will, and that really did build build a person. It's a lovely interplay of sort of memory and personality. That's an interesting concept, the interplay between memory and personality. The idea that your memory 
is not just where you keep useful information, but it's also a key to your identity as well. It's like the things you can remember about yourself, your, your experiences. So memory is so deeply important. It's very interesting. Now let's look at spelling mnemonics, okay? Mnemonics for remembering how to spell words. Now I realize I may have left the best until last here because now we're going to look at lots of common mnemonics for difficult spelling in English. Don't forget you can read all of this on my website which is teacherluke.wordpress.com. So let's get started. I've taken this list from Wikipedia actually and I've added some of my own as well. So let's look at mnemonics for spelling in English. So the characteristic sequence of letters. So here's one. I always become... I always comes before E. So I always comes before E but after C, E comes before I. Okay. In most words like friend, field, peace, pierce, mischief, thief, tear, it is I which comes before E. But on some words with C, just before the pair of E and I, like receive, perceive or receipt, E comes before I. And this can be remembered by the following mnemonic. I before E except after C. I before E except after C. Repeat it, it'll help you to remember it. I before E except after C. And it's memorable because it rhymes. I before E except after C. Okay, all right? So as a general rule, you should spell words with I and then E. But if you have C, it's E-I. This is not always obeyed, as in the case of some words, like the word weird. Weird. W-E-I-R-D. So you could say I before E except after C, except for weird, but weird is just weird, isn't it, you know? There are other words, though, like way, weight, height, neighbour. And this can be remembered by extending the mnemonic like this. I before E except after C, or when sounded A, as in neighbour, way, and weight, or when sounded like I, as in height, and weird is just weird. Another variant which avoids confusion when the two letters represent different sounds instead of a single sound, as in atheist or being, runs like this. When it says E, as double E, put I before E, but not after C. Wherever there is a Q, there is a U too. Wherever there's a Q, there's a U too. Most frequently, U follows Q. For example, in the word Q, queen, question, quack, Quark, quartz, quarry, quit, peak, talk, macaque, exchequer. So they all have Q followed by a U. Hence the mnemonic, wherever there's a Q, there's a U too. This is violated by some words. And you can actually see a list of those words by clicking on the link, which you'll see on my page, if you're following this. So when two vowels go walking, the first does the talking. This is really useful. When two vowels go walking, the first does the talking. All right. So that would be for words like oat or eat. Oat, that's O-A-T. Eat is E-A-T. The, here the second letter is A, and that's silent. So it's the first letter, O and E, which are pronounced in the examples. Okay, so oat, the O is the, the, the vowel which dictates how you pronounce it, and eat, it's the e, e. So when two vowels go walking, the first does the talking. All right? All right. Now, let's have some letters of specific syllables in a word. For example, believe, the word believe. Believe is spelt B-E-L-I-E-V-E. -E -E. So there's the word lie. Do not believe a lie. Do not believe a lie. That will help you remember the spelling of believe because it has the word lie in the middle, L-I-E. Do not believe a lie, okay? Secretary or secretary. Secretary has the word secret in the middle. Secret, in fact, at the beginning, the first half of the word is, is the word secret. So a secretary must keep a secret, okay? A secretary must keep a secret. The word principle, principle. Uh, the principal is your pal. Pal, P-A-L. Pal means friend. The principal is your pal. So you remember that principal has P-A-L at the end. Okay. So if you had like a really cool groovy principal in your school, you could say, I'm trying to put the pal back in principal. Okay. 
Yes, trying to put the fun back in fundamentalism doesn't work. Next one is the word teacher, teacher, which has T-E-A-C-H-E-R. So in the middle is, is the word ache, you know, like headache, stomach ache. That's A-C-H-E, ache. Teacher has the word ache in the middle. So you could say there is an ache in every teacher. It's true, isn't it? There is an ache in every teacher. What kind of ache? Probably a headache from the stress, maybe heartache, you know, for some some reason, because, you know, teachers often tend to be quite artistic, romantic people. The next one is measurement, measurement, M-E-A-S-U-R-E, M-E-N-T. So in the middle there is the word sure, measurement. So it says, be sure of your measurements before you start work. You should be sure of your measurements. And there you can find the word sure in the middle of the word measurement. Help you to remember how to spell measurement. Friend, friend, I-E. Well, there you have I before E. Okay, friend. But you can also say a friend is, is always there when the end comes. Because at the end of the word friend, you have E-N-D. A friend is always there when the end comes. Okay, all right. Fry, you have at the, the beginning, F-R-I, at the beginning of friend. So when Friday ends, you go out with your friends. Yeah, okay. Uh, special, special is spelt with the letter C-I-A. So S P E C I A L C I A criminal invest criminal investigation agency the C I A have special agents beautiful beautiful um, beautiful is a difficult one to spell because it's spelled B E A U T I F U L beautiful and it could be big elephants are ugly big elephants are ugly B E A U big elephants are ugly okay slaughter slaughter difficult one to spell but you'll see in the middle of the word slaughter you have the word laugh in fact laughter okay s-l-a-u-g-h-t-e-r so l-a-u-g-h is the word laugh slaughter is laughter with an s at the beginning that's it pieces pieces p-i-e-c-e-s pieces and pieces has the word pie at the beginning p-i-e pieces of a pie a piece of pie there you go. Assume, assume, and this is a classic one, this one. Assume, that's when you uh, just think something without really knowing whether it's true or not. You just imagine that it's true. Okay. For example, I, you know, I assumed that it wouldn't be a problem. And people sometimes say, well, when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. You make an ass out of you and me. So an ass, A double -S, S, and then U, and then M E assume don't assume because when you assume you make an ass out of you and me all right it's just how you remember how to spell assume separate separate s-e-p-a-r-a-t-e -E. um okay difficult one but you must remember that in there's the word rat or a rat okay s-e-p-a-r-a-t -E so the word a rat is in the middle always smell a rat when you spell separate or separate, always smell a rat. Okay. There was a farmer named Sep, and one day his wife saw a rat, and she, re and she shouted, Sep, a rat! E! Okay. Okay. Distinguishing between similar words. What's the difference between advice and advise, practice and practice, license and license? Okay. Advice is the noun. Advise is the verb. Advice is C-E at the end. Advise is S-E at the end. Practice is the noun. Practice with, a, with an S is the verb. Practice with the C is the noun. License with a C is the noun. License with an S is the verb. Okay. Advice, practice, license, those with C are nouns and advise, practice and license are verbs with an S. So one way of remembering this is that the word noun comes before the word verb in the dictionary. N, okay, comes before the, the letter V in the dictionary, all right? So it's in order. Likewise, the letter C comes before the letter S. So the nouns are practice, license, and advice, and the verbs are practice, license, and advise. So you just remember that there's a, a corresponding sequence in, in, in order of the letters. 
Okay, so the nouns come before the verbs. The nouns are spelt with the C, which comes before the S, which is used to spell the verbs. All right, here or here. Here meaning not there, but here, right here where we are now. And here meaning, sorry, I can't hear you. Here and here. We hear with our ear. Okay, we hear with our ear. So when you're listening, we use E A R, hear with our ear. All right, okay. Compliment and compliment. Okay, so compliment with an E, that's C O M P L E M E N T, adds something to make it enough. It adds something to make it enough. And compliment means to put you in the limelight. Okay, compliment, it's got the word lime in it to put you in the limelight. That's a bit of a complicated one. Principle and principle. Remember, your principal, that's the person, is your pal. And a rule can also be called a principal. Rule, R-U-L-E, L-E at the end. And principal, L-E at the end. So a rule can also be called a principal. They both have L-E at the end. Sculpture and sculptor. Sculpture is, is the, the, the work of art that's made by a, a person. The person is the sculptor. The work of art, sculpture, is spelt U-R-E, okay, at the end, T-U-R-E. And you could say a sculpture is like a picture. Picture is also spelt T-U-R-E at the end. This list goes on and on. I'm going to just keep flying through it. Let's, let's move on to the first letter mnemonics of spelling, okay? These were acrostics, okay? So let's, let's look at the word diarrhea, shall we? It's not a very nice word, and it's certainly not a very nice thing to experience. Diarrhea, you know, when you eat something bad, you might have food poisoning, you have to keep going to the toilet to do poo. It's not nice. Okay, so diarrhea, it's usually an, an emergency, isn't it? It's like, oh God, I've got to get to the toilet quick. I've got diarrhea, help. Obviously, you wouldn't shout that. You probably wouldn't shout, help, I've got diarrhea. I could explode at any moment. I wouldn't advise shouting that out in a public place. You should probably just say, um, sorry, excuse me, could you show me where the toilet is? I just I do need to go to the toilet rather quickly. Anyway, diarrhea. It's di very difficult to spell. D-I-A-R-R-H-O-E-A. -R -R -E what's the H doing in the middle of that? And how many vowels do you need in a word? D-I-A-R-R-H-O-E-A. -R -R -E diarrhea. Now, how do you remember that? You could say dashing in a rush, running harder, or else accident. Dashing in a rush, running harder, or else accident. All right, or dining in a rough restaurant, hurry, otherwise expect accidents. <laughs> oh my goodness. Dining in a rough restaurant, hurry, otherwise expect accidents. <laughs> I suppose that tells the story of someone who got food poisoning from dining in a rough restaurant. Hurry, otherwise expect accidents. All right, next one is diarrhea is a really runny heap of endless amounts. <laughs> diarrhea is a really runny heap. A heap is like a pile of endless amounts. Diarrhea is a really runny heap of endless amounts. Arithmetic, meaning sort of like mathematics, you know, counting, adding numbers up. Arithmetic. A-R-I-T-H-M-E-T-I-C. A rat in the house may eat the ice cream. A rat in the house may eat the ice cream. Lots of rats and mice involved in this episode of Luke's English Podcast today. I hope you don't have any phobias or anything. A rat in the house may eat the ice cream. Arithmetic. A red Indian thought he might eat tulips in class. That is a bizarre one. A red Indian thought he might eat tulips in class. It's bizarre, but maybe memorable. You can imagine a Native American eating a flower in, in, in Holland. I don't know. Necessary. Ah, very tricky one to spell. N-E-C-E-S-S-A-R-Y. Necessary. I always remembered this one in school as never eat cereal, eat salmon sandwiches. Never eat cereal, eat salmon sandwiches. N-E-C-E-S-S and then A-R-Y. Here we have, not every cat eats sardines. Some are really yummy. <laughs> not every cat eats sardines. Some are really yummy. Never eat crisps. Eat salad sandwiches and remain young. 
It's quite a good one. Because, because, B-E-C-A-U-S-E. Big elephants can always understand small elephants. <laughs> I like the logic of that, that big elephants can always understand small elephants. Why? Is it big elephants are more intelligent because they're older, I suppose. Got bigger brains. Big elephants could always understand small elephants. Big elephants cause accidents under small elephants. What? How? How does a big elephant get under a small elephant? Surely it would be the other way around. Doesn't really make sense. Big elephants can't always use small exits. <laughs> true. It's very true. If there's a building, let's say you're having an animal conference, and you've got all the animals around. Maybe you've got, you know, like, right, okay, that's the end of the conference. See you next time. And all the animals leave, and there's just a big elephant left at the end. And you say, what? why are you still here, Mr. Elephant? And he goes, well, I can't fit through the, s the exit. It's too small. Like, well, how did you get in here? No, oh, don't ask so many questions. Big elephants can't always use small exits. And then the next one is big elephants can't always use small entrances either. So, yeah, surely if they can, surely the, the exit example doesn't make sense because surely if they can't get in, how are they supposed to get out? Big elephants can't always use small entrances because geography, geography, G-E-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. All right, there's a lot of consonants. George's elderly old grandfather rode a pig home yesterday. George's elderly old grandfather rode a pig home yesterday. Geography. Now, what is the connection between geography, like countries and stuff, and George's elderly old grandfather riding a pig home yesterday it's certainly a vivid image the next one is the word tomorrow tomorrow t-o-m-o-double-r-o-w not double m double r and here's how you remember that one trials of my old red rose over window what trail sorry trails of my old red rose over window uh, okay i don't get that one you just have to remember double r Old red rose, maybe red rose, that might help. If you imagine a red rose tomorrow, someone's going to bring you a red rose tomorrow. That's a nice thought. Rhythm, rhythm. We've got melody, harmony, and rhythm. It's a difficult one. R-H-Y-T-H-M. And it's a good one here. Rhythm helps your two hips move. Rhythm helps your two hips move. Maybe you can just use this as an excuse to think about... Who's that Colombian superstar? I've probably got people all around the world going, shouting out the name of this, this person. Shakira, that's it. This is just a good excuse for you to imagine Shakira's hips moving to the rhythm because rhythm helps your two hips move. Okay, I think that's probably a good, it's probably a good time for me to just stop uh, this episode because um, it's not going to get much better than Shakira's beautiful Colombian hips moving to the rhythm because rhythm helps your two hips move. It's not going to get much better than that, folks, in this episode. So that's the end of it. I think you'll all agree that this has been a stunningly useful exploration into the mind, memory learning techniques, and the ways in which you can improve your uh, recall of vocab. And don't forget that this will really work best for you if you try these techniques you don't have to use them all just try some of them just think of situations in which you're having trouble remembering things see if you can just add some of the techniques that i've looked at in this episode remember to keep it vivid keep it weird keep it funny and personal and attach memories to to uh, things that you already remember make connections and that's that's a really good meaningful way of uh, memorizing stuff and i'm sure it's going to help you learn uh, all those phrasal verbs that I've been teaching you okay don't forget you can leave your comments and questions uh, in the comments section for this episode and there'll be more of this kind of thing in the near future so like like the page on Facebook follow me on Twitter and tell your friends about Luke's English podcast for now though it's goodbye bye bye